Good afternoon, everyone. I'm speaking English here because our next, next guest we are very, very glad to introduce, all the way from South Africa, Trevor Stein. So the marketing team says I need to be more personable than everybody because I'm a bit of a scientist. I don't really enjoy standing in front of, I don't enjoy being in too many crowds at all, but instead of standing in front of a whole lot of people is not comfortable at all. So anyway, uh, my version of telling you more about me is maybe that I'm 44% Dutch, 32% British, Irish, 8% Swedish, 2% Finnish, uh, and then some general Northwestern European, and then 2.5% Chinese, and 2% Filipino. So that's my genetic breakdown. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we're based in South Africa. We're primarily focused on the skin microbiome and ways to build skin care around the skin's microbes. So I think this is uh, very topical now, uh, but we've kind of been working on it since 2010, so for us it's, uh, it's, it's kind of strange to suddenly have a little bit more focus on this topic, but that's cool. Um, so I'm going to rush very quickly through some basics because I know the levels in the audience are, are different. So a microbe is a single-celled organism and your microbiome is all the microbes in and on you. And those microbes come from different categories. Uh, bacteria make up the majority um, in terms of mass. Uh, Archaea are a relatively small group, they make up around 5%. Viruses in numbers are huge, but in mass are relatively low, somewhere around 10%. And fungi, uh, they're big cells, um, so they're relatively high by mass and relatively low by numbers. Um, so fungi you would maybe know as yeast. Just to give you an idea of the different sizes of the cells, human cells are about that size, blood cells are about that size, bacteria are about one-tenth of the size of a human cell, uh, viruses are about one-tenth of the size of, of a bacteria. So you're made of cells and most of them aren't human. I don't know if you've heard the figure uh, being used a lot but there are around 10 times more microbial cells in your body than there are human cells. It's a little bit misleading in a way. Um, if that's the number of human cells in your body, then you have, if you're female, you have around 2.1 times more bacteria in your body than you do human cells. If you're male, then around 1.3 times. But by both measures, you have more bacterial cells in your body than you do human cells. Archaea make up a relatively smaller amount. Uh, the fungi, by numbers, are not that large, like I said. But it's viruses that make up a huge part of your microbiome. So, for each bacterium, there are at least 10 viruses. So viruses sound really scary, right? Oh, please, by the way, if you think of a question, just ask it while I'm talking because it's actually easier to deal with these things as they, as they come up because in this context. So please ask questions during this talk. So we've been evolving with this microbiome for a really long time and pretty much all multicellular life has been evolving with its microbiome for a really long time. Microbes were around 2 billion years before any multicellular life, so they set the rules for more than one cell getting together. So a tree has its microbiome and it's very specific and uh, 
piece of coral has its microbiome and that's really specific and that's true for pretty much every large thing. So from a human point of view, we've been evolving with our skin microbes for about 2 million years now. Uh, that's when we lost fur. Uh, so we started walking upright around about then and about that point we lost fur so that we could move quickly across the savannah for a long period of time because we couldn't lose heat by sweating. And the human skin microbiome is completely different from that of any other mammal. So we've developed a really weird bunch of microbes that live on our skins and those microbes cannot live without us and we can't live healthily without them. But we're losing some of these old friends. Um, if you look at the human skin microbiome, uh, Westerners have lost already somewhere around 35% of the diversity on their skin. Um, so we, we, we sample widely, uh, so we do, we do swabs on, on skin, usually using the forehead, uh, and we sampled everywhere from Namibia through Sweden and elsewhere. Um, when you look at the difference between Western skin microbiomes and more traditional living people, the difference is enormous. You might think, uh, well, maybe it's the species that's a little bit lower or higher. There's, there's, a, there's almost no common ground when you look at these two groups. So there have been huge changes in our microbiome. So the hygiene hypothesis uh, is starting slowly to change the way that people view skin care and other sort of household products. And it's basically saying that the lack of early exposure to symbiotic microbes increases the susceptibility to allergic diseases later in life. So the premise is that if a young child doesn't get to see the microbes that it should, it does, it's, in, its immune system isn't educated to respond sensibly to attacks later in life and it starts responding to tiny little attacks uh, in the absence of real ones. So the hygiene hypothesis is slowly starting to take a grip um, and it's basically saying that you shouldn't be too sterile in your daily life, especially children, especially below the age of three. Okay, so that was just to give a little bit of background to what I was going to talk about, which is an ancestral skin condition. So acne is very rare in hunter-gatherers. Um, it doesn't matter where you go in the world. Uh, you can go to the Hadza in northern Namibia. They don't even have a word for acne. Um, I strangely enough spent some time out there uh, we harvest a resurrection plant from the deserts in northern Namibia, so every now and again we have to go and check the sustainability of that harvest because these people are harvesting for us uh, and we need to check that we're not threatening the species. So I sat down with a group of maybe 30 of them uh, with a really good translator and I tried to get an idea from them of how many of them got acne. Um, and I, they don't have a word for acne, so the, tr the translator was having some trouble. And uh, eventually, after a long period of negotiation between the translator and, and, the, and the Himba people that we were talking to, one of them got this like, oh, we know what you're talking about. It's the acne stuff that the German tourists get. <laughs> <laughs> so they they don't they don't they don't have a framework for acne. They don't understand where that would come from. And it doesn't matter if you look in Africa or if you look in South America or if you look in the Philippines or if you look in Australia 
or even the very few voluntary hunter-gatherers that are left in Europe. Um, <laughs> the, there is no acne. Uh, so hunter-gatherers don't have a problem with this, and yet 85% of teenagers that live a Western lifestyle have this issue. Um, and 18% of children have eczema. That also doesn't happen in, in, in hunter-gatherer communities. So we're genetically the same as these people. That there's no, there hasn't been time for us to shift our entire genetics. That happens too slowly. So what is it that's different between us and them? Because evolution doesn't really allow 85% of a natural population to get a skin condition. Uh, at, in, on the most prominent body part at the time of long-term mate selection. So I had, I had acne as a teenager and I remember thinking, this, this is like a really sick sense of humor. Like, why can't I get a pimple on my knee rather? Like, I can't hide this. <laughs> so, like, yeah, there's a, it, it, is, it is not something that evolution would allow in a normal population. So it's definitely something that we're doing in our modern lives. So what's different between us and hunter-gatherers? Diet is clearly different. The use of antibiotics is a major impact on the microbiome. And we now know that that is a potential, that is a potential contributor. Exposure to sun uh, is very different between us and natural living people. Soap and microbes, they're exposed to huge numbers of microbes. So I'll just take one, I'll take those quickly uh, point by point. So diet. Hunter-gatherer diets are not the same. You might, you might try to average them out. But they're so radically different that it's actually really tough. Um, the Maasai live on blood, milk, and meat. They eat very, very little vegetable. So, and yet they have no acne. Um, compare that. Oh, uh, so the the they also have no obesity. Um, and. They don't have skin cancer, even though they're in the sun six plus hours a day. Um, the modern diet is very low in unsaturated fats. It's high in freely available carbohydrates, and it's really low in fiber. So traditional living people, just to give you an idea, are getting somewhere around 120 grams of soluble fiber per day. We consider a high fiber diet to be 30. So there's a shift there. Uh, and there are residual synthetic chemicals in pretty much everything we eat now. So I don't know, eat nuts and berries, eat fruit and vegetable, there's nothing amazing in this. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't take sugar and other processed carbohydrates and eat organic if you can. But one thing that I wanted to point out is that what you eat affects what oil is produced on the surface of your skin. So most of us are eating high saturated fats. Um, that basically forces your sebum uh, into a difficult space because a lot of the fatty acids that are produced on the surface of skin are unsaturated. And your body can't take a saturated fat and make it into an unsaturated fat. So if you're not eating unsaturated fats, it shifts what type of oil you produce on the surface of your skin. So sun, uh, we spend around 87% of our time indoors, about 6% of our time in cars, and the remainder outdoors. That's not normal. Uh, normally we would wake up in the morning and the cave that we were staying in wouldn't be particularly comfortable <laughs> in the odor or thing go and line the sun probably to warm up and then take a little wander around looking for food. So 
our skins are not making enough vitamin D at the moment. So if you look in the US, the figures here are not much better by the way, but almost 70% of the population is deficient in vitamin D. So 30 nanograms per mil is below that is considered deficient. I did mine uh, and I was at 48 nanograms per mil uh, and I was like, I told you surfing was a good idea. And then I found out what hunter-gatherer averages are and I'm nowhere. So a traditional living Maasai person is at 311 nanograms average. Uh, this is for traditional living hunter-gatherers that are, that are part of the Hadza group, so they have a slightly more forest kind of space. I think if you look at Europeans, our natural level would probably be a little lower, but it'd be a lot higher than 30. And if you look at the symptoms of vitamin D deficiency, it's depression, autoimmune disease, and cancer. So I'd like to see whether large pharma corporate pharmaceutical companies would be without those sets. Anyway, the, if you look at the world melanoma rate, because um, people are normally scared to go in the sun because you may get skin cancer, in 1935, around about 2 out of 100,000 people got skin cancer. Over the next, whatever that is, 90 years, call it, there's been a 14-fold increase in skin cancer. So that's set against the, oh, I don't know, I don't, did you, do, I personally doubt that people in 1935 were exposed to less sun than we are now? Seems unlikely. And in 1940, uh, the highest SPF you could buy was 4. Uh, 1960, the highest SPF you could buy was 8. Uh, then, with the development of Eva Benzone and others, uh, around 1980, you could get SPF 25. You draw your own conclusions. I mean, this is, it's correlation, it's not causation, but still, if sunscreens are supposed to be preventing melanoma, they're doing a pretty spectacularly bad job. Um, so UV light kills most microbes. So in Namibia, for example, they'll take a normal polypropylene drinking bottle of water, one liter, and put it in the sun for half an hour, even if that water is really bad. At the end of half an hour of UV exposure under African sun, that water is sterile. So sunlight does a pretty good job of killing microbes. But if you look at skin microbes, a lot of them are pigmented. So they, they contain carotenoids and other pigmented um, components that allow them to protect themselves against UV light. So if you can think through the lens of a skin microbe, the human goes wandering into the sun, pretty much everybody else dies. You though have your carotenoids to protect you. You come back inside and of course you're the first to start regrowing really quickly. So the sunlight suits our co-evolved microbes and we're not getting very much. So antibiotics. Is there anyone who has never taken an antibiotic? I wish I could say I'd never taken an antibiotic, but unfortunately I haven't. Some of my children haven't, which is a good one for them. Uh, so antibiotics kill bacteria. A lot of them are administered as a preventative uh, techniques for viral infections. So a doctor will often see a viral, a viral infection and go, well, I'm going to give you an antibiotic just in case there's a secondary infection, which I think is a bad idea. Um, and they permeate throughout the body. So that antibiotic goes into your gut, crosses the barrier and goes into your bloodstream and permeates throughout your body into the lower layers of skin 
and everywhere else. So they looked at the skin microbiome after antibiotic exposure and they expected to see a drop in diversity and in numbers and they saw that very quickly. So it was a two week course of, of antibiotics. Uh, after two weeks they measured again uh, and the, mic the skin microbiome hadn't quite recovered yet. Um, after two months they looked again and there still wasn't complete recovery of the diversity. So they got extra funding to look again after a year and there still wasn't complete recovery so they looked again at two years still not complete and at three years they didn't get more funding to complete but at three years they still didn't have complete restoration of the skin microbiome. So that sounds like really terrible but uh, you should bear in mind that it came close. So there was, you know, after, after the antibiotic exposure, there was a rise in, in, in diversity again, but it just never quite got back to where it originally started. So when you take an antibiotic dose, you are going to lose some partners. Avoiding exposure is not so easy. Um, you know, there, you can't get away from the fact that antibiotics increase the rate of growth for livestock animals. So chicken, beef, pork, pick something there. Antibiotics are used to increase the rate of growth for pretty much all of those animals. Um, and the technique is usually that the farmer goes, well, that one got sick, so I spread all of them um, just so that it didn't spread. And then they will grow faster and he makes more money, I guess. Uh, so yes, I want the short story is that antibiotics, antibiotics find their way into our food stream, which is another reason to eat organic. Um, soap. I really don't like soap. Uh, soap generally is at a pH of somewhere around 10. Uh, skin pH when we're young and healthy starts off at around 4.4 and as we get older and older it drifts sort of to 5.2. Um, pushing your skin pH to 10 kind of means that any microbe is able to start growing. Microbes don't like operating at like 4.5, that's a horrible pH for most microbes. Um, particularly acidic, and you know, that's it's not nice for them down there. They've got to work really hard to absorb nutrients across their, their membranes. So your microbiome is super pH sensitive, and there's a reason that your skin, micro, my, your skin pH is around four and a half. It's to very clearly select out the majority of microbes, and only select for the few that are co-evolved to live at low pH on skin. So look at a dog's skin pH, it's around 7. So humans are kind of a little bit weird in having this really low skin pH. So we produce a whole bunch of oil on the surface of skin and that's really really weird oil as well and it costs us a lot. So we're producing around 14 grams a day on the surface of skin, and that's about 7% of our caloric intake. I can't find a way to work out the, because it's not a complete conversion if you do the actual maths. So it's definitely more, it's costing us more than 7%, but I can't find a way to work out the actual metabolic cost of producing these strange oils. But still, at the best calculation, 7% of the food we put in our mouth is excreted onto the surface of skin as well. And our response is to apply something that removes that oil and wash it down the drain. You don't think that's a good idea. Especially because it's so weird and replacing it's going to be so hard. So cyanic acid makes up around 25% of the fatty acids in human skin. And it's called sapienic acid because it's only found in homo sapiens. 
It's not found anywhere else in the, in the, in the animal kingdom. It's also not found in any of our internal organs. So here we are producing this superbly curated oil, this like, really, really weird oil onto the surface of our skin at huge genetic cost, by the way. So if you look, it's not just metabolic cost. You know, the metabolic cost is around 7% of our, of our food intake. The genetic cost is also huge. So if you look at the difference between the chimpanzee, uh, the chimpanzee genome and the human genome, the biggest difference is in the skin clade, in the, in the group of genes that control skin. So we have very, very strange skin genetically and, and it's expensive to produce this oil and that's a very, very specific food for the microbiome. So whenever you look at an ecosystem, the best thing to do is look back into where the food source is. So we've started viewing sedum as an incredibly powerful prebiotic for the skin microbiome because very little else is able to eat sapienic acid. So sapienic acid is very, very toxic to Staph aureus, for example. Uh, that, I don't know if you guys have Bactroban here, yeah, but it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it, it's great at killing Staph aureus. Sapienic acid is as powerful as, as Bactroban, as the active ingredient in Bactroban at killing Staph aureus. And yet we've shown in our labs that it can be used by skin microbes as a food. So you have this super targeted weird food that's toxic to some bad species and food for, for good species. And again, that's what we choose to wash down the drain. I don't think sebum is the enemy. So in this room, it's got a really high ceiling, is we are by far and away the largest source of microbes. And there's nothing other than human here for microbes to grow, right? And we are emitting microbes at a huge rate right now. So what our skin microbiome is in contact with is other human microbes, which is kind of weird. Uh, I mean, there wouldn't really be too many instances for a hunter-gatherer where they would be in a situation where the only microbes around were the human ones. They would be digging in soil, and soil has much higher numbers than, than ours. Uh, they would be eating plants. Plants have their own microbiome. They would be constantly exposed to plant microbes. They would be hunting. They, they, as they moved around, they would be exposed to huge numbers of very diverse other microbes. And yet we spend all of our time in this massively dominant human microbe space. Which is, uh, which is okay if, if you plan to catch good germs, but you know, is it kind of not what we're very well developed for. And I think we've made an error, I mean, this is a summary, I guess, of the hygiene hypothesis, but we've made an error in thinking at the end of the, the 18th, you know, the 1800s and the early 1900s when multinational companies covered into this germs are bad thing and you should be patriotic and you should sterilize your home and think of the children. And, and you know, the, the, we, we've been kind of to thinking that germs are bad so zero germs must be good. But like, we evolved with germs. We're composed of germs like we need each other. And I think we need to just have a little rethink. And I think we've done the same with sun. I think, I think we've gone, sun's pro-aging and potentially dangerous if, we ex if we're exposed too much. And I'm not denying, like, you know, it's like if you take a, a Swede and put them on the equator, but it's not going to go well. It's, it's so because we're not even we're not evolved for that. It's like, but I, I also don't think that zero sun is the answer. 
thing. You like Swedish sun is the answer. <laughs> it's like uh, I think I think I think you know this is you know, because too much is bad doesn't mean that zero is good. Can you define a germ? A germ? Yeah. I just said it's a microbe. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I use those two interchangeably. So things that affect your skin microbiome. Antibiotics, as I said, whether you're born by cesarean section or natural birth has an influence. Exposure to treated water. Uh, we're, you know, we bathe every day in chlorinated water. That's probably not a great result. Preservatives and cosmetic products. Exposure to sanitizers and soap. And lack of exposure to the natural environment. I really like this trend of forest bathing that's sort of coming out of Japan. Uh, other influences on the microbiome, temperature, humidity, light, as I've spoken about, skin structure. Um, so if you look at skin, you have these cavities that naturally develop as skin exfoliates, and it creates these pockets for microbes to thrive in where they're slightly protected from UV light and have a food source in the form of the huge amount of oil that we're producing. So you know, from one lens, it looks as though skin is a feeding and housing scheme for microbes. You know, if it looks like it's, it's definitely not trying to minimize the number of microbes, that's for sure. And there are constant transient microbes. So if we were exposed to you know, the outdoors a lot, we would have constant new microbes arriving. Life on skin is not easy, that's for sure. So they would arrive, die, and move on. But with this uh, skin-brain axis, and this at the risk of sounding super heavy, but the, there seems to be fairly good evidence that exposure to a variety of external microbes influences our mood. Um, and then I don't know if you've, I mean, you would have heard of the gut-brain axis. The skin-brain axis is seemingly equally important. So when I'm in the ocean, I'm generally very happy, I think, because there are a lot of microbes there. <laughs> Surfactants, uh, yeah, so it's not a great result for the microbiome. Some of the big companies are even admitting this at this point where they're doing microbiome studies on you know, surfactants like sodium lauryl sulfate or lauryl sulfate. So they're showing that these have a massive, cause a massive drop in diversity in the skin microbiome. Preservatives and antibiotics, treated water, and then probiotics. So. I think probiotics are due for a bit of a revolution in skin space, but we'll talk about that just now. So the way that we influence what can grow on our skin is via the lamella oil that we produce. So that's those the little oil pockets in the skin cells as they rise closer and closer to the surface and as they get to the surface they release that oil. And then our sebaceous oil, so the oil that's produced in the sebaceous gland as well. Sweat is pretty amazing also. So a friend of mine in Belgium, Chris Kallewert, is uh, he studies the armpit microbiome and he has taken a really long time to try to build uh, a synthetic sweat so that he can study the microbes that would normally live in sweat. But it's hard. It's like really, really hard to build synthetic sweat because sweat includes <laughs> antimicrobial peptides and all sorts of stuff that like, it's just not that easy to replicate in a lab. He's done some cool studies, by the way. Like he did a he did an armpit microbiome transplant. <laughs> so he found two twins, uh, and and the one guy smelled awful, and the other guy smelled fine. And when I say awful, like, you would start commenting at about two meters away from them. So, you know, you know awful. So, um, he used an, a, a, 
topical antibiotic to kill the microbes under, under, the one, under the smelly twins armpit, uh, and then ethanol and then bleach. <laughs> so he did a good job. Uh, and then he took swab. But it's humans that influence the whole space, right? It's like, and we make up like 0.01% of the global, bio, uh, the glo global biomass. So we believe quite strongly that the devil's in the details. We look at those species that are below 1%. We're not that interested in these massive contributors. I think it's super important that you have diversity of strain in these big contributors. But the small contributors could be the key influences in that, in that ecology. And there's no doubt skin is an ecology. And the analogies with real life ecologies are worthwhile exploring. Yeah. So in general, a diverse ecology is, is healthy. So you look at the Amazon jungle, for example, you have thousands and thousands of species in a one square kilometer patch. So if there's a shift, let's say it gets slightly warmer or rains a little bit more or whatever, whatever that shift is, there are a whole lot of species with a range. So the ecology can shift a little bit and things change, but the diversity remains and the ecology stays healthy. But if you have an ecology that only had one or two species and conditions change a little bit, that species could well just die. You could be left with nothing but an open space for opportunistic microbes to pull, well, opportunistic species to pull in. So it's a little bit like plowing a field. If you know that's going to be a space for anything to arrive. But if you have a diverse eco ecology there, then it's not so easy for anything else to arrive. So there was a salmonella outbreak in Chicago, for example, and I think it was 35,000 people got ill. Uh, and what they did is they looked back into their medical records for the last three months. And if somebody had taken an antibiotic in the previous three months, their chance of getting ill increased enormously. So what had happened is they had reduced the diversity in their microbiome. Then when they were exposed to salmonella, it only took like one or two microbes and they were, they were getting super ill. But if their microbiome was, in, was intact, they wouldn't, they would have, it would have been perfectly fine. And this isn't new news. This, 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 these studies were done in the early 1960s already. They worked out the exact numbers. Like if you expose a mouse to antibiotics, then it only takes three it only takes three microbes to make that mouse ill. If that mouse hadn't been exposed to antibiotics, it takes more than a hundred thousand. So you've got to be really, really careful after an antibiotic course or anything else that might have dropped the diversity on the surface of skin. Yeah, I think more and more we're starting to look at that as, as our protective layer. Like, you don't produce that much oil on the surface of skin at such huge metabolic cost for nothing. It's almost certainly to feed this protective layer that acts as your living armor. So what are the other microbes on, this, on the skin? I talked about other different classes. So one of the limiting factors, I must say, in the swabs that anybody would do right now is that they measure bacteria only. And also they measure bacteria whether they're alive or dead. Um, so it's still important to do culture studies is what I'm trying to say. Even though this new genetic sequencing is amazing and we use it a lot, it's just getting back to the lab to do culture studies is still super important. So archaea is not well understood. They're really weird. The, they've, they're very difficult to grow. Um, and it looks like we're, we're, we're all of 
eukaryotic life, so our kinds of cells. Where that came from is when an archaea ate a bacterium, and so the bacterium are now the mitochondria in our cells. Uh, and the nucleus was another microbe that got eaten, probably also a bacterium. So we're like a weird symbiosis already, even at a cellular level. Um, the archaea on skin make up four and a half percent and they're not particularly well understood. Uh, they're, like I said, difficult to, to work with. Um, Malassezia is a kind of yeast, it likes high oil sites, so it is very prevalent. I mean, we're, we're pretty clear, you know, the, the different sites are so different that we've got to specialize somewhere. So we've, we've specialized on the facial skin microbiome. Um, and malassezia is an issue there, so what well, an issue, it's a factor, it's a normal resident. So Malassezia is really good at digesting fatty acids, so what you have is propionobacterium cutting the fatty acids off the glycerine and then you have uh, malassezia quite good at digesting those fatty acids from there. Viruses, I showed you the you know, 10 viruses for each bacteria. Most of those viruses eat bacteria. Well, they don't eat them, they infect them and then explode the bacteria. Uh, and yeah, they, so they, about 10 for each bacteria. And there is now quite a lot of phage therapy, um, particularly in Eastern Europe. There's some really exciting work going on. Um, where they're commercially now using, so infecting somebody with a virus that attacks one specific kind of bacteria. So in a case where they come across a, a bacterial infection that is resistant to all of the antibiotics that they try, they then resort to this phage therapy where they, they use a virus to take that bacteria out, which I think is quite cool. But I think it's going to be quite hard to market. <laughs> um, do I have the same skin microbes everywhere on my skin? So there are different ecosystems on skin. Moist ecosystems, so maybe armpits. Uh, oily ecosystem, face. Dry ecosystem, maybe uh, forearms. And then feet are just kind of pretty nuts. <laughs> Seriously. It's like they, there's like the microbes that grow there are like completely different to everywhere else, so we just ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else can get into foot microbiome. Um, so there you can see the dominant microbes on each of the sites. Um, so you don't have the same microbes everywhere, and yeah, we've chosen to specialize on the facial skin microbiome. So we have a, a probiotic serum. I'm saying that. Uh, culture studies were still important. So before applying the probiotic serum, that's a swab of the skin. So each of those dots is one colony of, of bacteria growing. Okay. Um, two hours after applying, oh. so two hours after applying the probiotic serum, I mean, you can see the numbers you know, it's like a hundred times more colonies there than there are there. So we have, you know, we within two hours we can we can show that there, there are a huge number of live, actively growing microbes on the surface of skin. So these are the genetic studies. Uh, so before, that's what the skin microbiome looks like. And these are averages, by the way. Um, eight hours after applying this, the, the probiotic serum, um, you see this pink section, that's lactobacillus. Um, so lactobacillus is making up a reasonable chunk of the skin microbiome after eight hours. Um, after 24 hours, you can see it's dropped substantially. So we, we've subsequently done more studies. After 48 hours, it's making up somewhere around 3%. So why did we choose lactobacillus, uh, it's gut microbe? So one reason for us choosing lactobacillus is that lactobacillus is the microbe that is seeded onto 
children's skin as they enter the world. So around five days prior to natural birth, a woman's uh, vaginal microbiome shifts very heavily across to lactobacillus, lactobacillus dominance. So you have uh, relatively different vaginal microbiomes, but just before birth, they all start looking very similar and all start being really dominant in lactobacilli. And that basically seeds that child's skin as it enters the world with an enormous amount of lactobacilli. So we think that's relevant. Uh, it's not likely that that would have evolved without some benefits. So lactobacillus can live at low pH. The lactobacillus are salt tolerant, so that's another reason to use them. They can handle some oxygen, so on the surface of skin they're exposed to oxygen. That's a good trait. They're widely distributed in nature, so in our normal daily lives we would have come across these microbes. It's not like a weird new one that's, that we're using. Uh, and from a regulation point of view, they have grass and QPS status, so we were able to get them into the EU. So we were the first company to get a live product into the EU, and it wasn't very easy. It took us like six months because there are rules, and, pro and cosmetic products are not supposed to have any microbes in them. As a matter of fact, if they have more than 100 per one milliliter, then can't come in. to the EU. Uh, we were advertising 1 billion live microbes <laughs> per milliliter, so the customs officials said, that's very nice, butter off back to Africa, please. <laughs> so we had to go through a really long and painful process to convince them, first, that they were safe, second, that they worked. So like from the, the probiotics germ, for example, went through safety testing at quite a high level in Germany. Um, and then went on to efficacy testing so that we could prove that 100% of the women that used the product had an a statistically significant improvement in skin firmness over the course of 28 days. Um, and it wasn't until then that the customs guys let us through. So we often get, because we're uh, cruelty free, and we often get asked, uh, look, if you don't test on animals, how do we? How do you test your products? And I always go, look, I'm, we would never test our products on animals. We only test on German people. <laughs> <laughs> so lactic acid. Uh, so what we did is we we selected for strains in uh, we selected for lactobacillus strains that produced maximum hyaluronic acid. So that was a that was a major target for us. So. We quite like the idea of installing these little hyaluronic acid factories in your skin. Um, they also, one of the species is selected for its antimicrobial peptide production. So that species throws out lots of uh, a peptide that is toxic to bad guys and not toxic to good guys. You know? There are no good and bad bacteria, by the way. They're all going to eat you when you die. <laughs> so T junctions, uh, a lot of these lactobacilli, in the same way as you get leaky gut, the lactobacilli can help to restore barrier function. So you have T junctions in your gut. Pro oral probiotics can help to restore that barrier function, and it's the same in skin. So we have T junctions in our skin, and lactobacilli can help to restore that. The, the, can improve the quality and quantity of 
those teacher. And our bodies just recognize these things. Uh, so they do have an immune calming effect. Um, so probiotics, time? Seven minutes. Uh, oh, well. Okay, so these are just a couple of really short little clips just to try and get some concepts across. So that's the surface of skin covered with, with microbes. Um, and no. ah, there's a bad guy. Uh, so that's staph aureus. It's now trying to land on, on the surface. Uh, if there aren't uh, like in this situation, if there's, you know, if there's not good coverage, if you don't have a, a large number of microbes on the surface, that staff can land and lock in, um, which is obviously not great, not a great result for skin. Um, so once it's locked in, it starts, it starts to grow, uh, it starts to use the available nutrients to grow. If you've got good coverage though, those microbes have occupied all the space um, and are eating all the available food. So that thing has no option but to either die or bugger off. <laughs> they, they don't bounce off like that the way they die. <laughs> um, so this is another example, basically what, uh, see, see the, the yellow ones are, are lactobacillus by the way, um, and the yellow one, the, the, the lactobacillus can stimulate skin cells to produce uh, antimicrobial peptides that kill staph, so that's a good result. Uh, improving barrier function, basically the signaling, so you can see the lactobacillus signaling the human cells and that stimulates the formation of those T-junctions and then you have improved barrier function. So once you've got a better barrier function, it means that you're not losing water so fast, so the skin remains moisturized. It also means that toxins can't get in so easily, uh, which is, barrier function is super important. And the, if you have that happening across a whole layer, nice and nice and constantly, then your skin's in a, uh, your skin's immune system isn't being triggered. It's it's in a state of balance. Uh, probiotics can also stimulate the skin to produce uh, moisturizing factors, and moisturizing factors are produced by the by the microbes themselves. So lactobacillus producing hyaluronic acid is an example. So they can slow aging, they can protect you from, from toxins, um, they can help you maintain your skin pH, and they can reduce sensitivity, and that's one of the, one of the key results that we found. So just to sunlight quickly, um, you know, the different uh, wavelengths penetrate to different degrees, so UVC I would consider a massive impact, but UVB goes sort of down to the basal layer and UVA goes through to potentially damage collagen and elastin. But uh, what is the effect on the skin mount microbiome? So I showed you these two slides earlier, that was baseline and that was after two hours after using the probiotic serum. If that, so this is four hours later, if the person has stayed in the shade, so these were half-face studies, so pretty much the whole research team put probiotic serum on and then uh, did like a cover for the one side of your, of your face and then lay in the sun for 10 minutes at the end of four hours. And I mean it's no surprise, uh, the sun is very strongly antimicrobial to normal microbes and lactobacilli don't have defense for sun exposure. So exposure to sun definitely eliminates the bulk of the lactobacilli on the surface of skin. 
So some good or bad for your microbiome? Well, it's definitely going to favor co-evolved microbes over pathogens. Um, so I think, I think in general, some is a, a good result. So do synthetic ingredients damage skin microbiomes? Well, in a general, as a general rule, if it's a complex ecosystem, just don't pollute it. It doesn't make sense to, in a com complex e ecosystem, to add uh, synthetic chemicals which have unknown outcomes. So I've shown this slide so many times now, but this is a, this is a, a microbiome study of um, uh, of skin. So this is Rob Knight, Martin Blazer, Richard Geller, and a few others at UC San Diego. And basically, here you see sodium lauryl sulfate. So that's the foaming agent in shampoos generally. Um, so these, these, the, the people that were tested, they weren't allowed to use cosmetics for three days. Uh, after three days, they did these uh, swabs and ran them through GCMSs, and they also looked at the skin microbiome. So you see this guy's shampoo. So this is three days after he'd used any cosmetic products. So this guy's shampoo clearly had sodium lauryl sulfate in. You can see the concentrations in his head still. And you can see where he probably showers because it runs down his chest and back. And then you can see obviously you, this, you know, the, this from rubbing, rubbing his hair. Cocobita propyl betaine is used in some organic products. It's another foaming agent. Um, and you can see again, this was probably in his body wash because you can see it's more evenly distributed across his whole body. Uh, again, concentrated in the hands. Um, some of the other curveballs were avobenzone. I really dislike these things. Those are sunscreen ingredients. Um, as an example, as, as an example, octocrylene is uh, super toxic to coral and I would guess to humans. Uh, I mean, it's been shown to. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. I probably run out of time now. Uh, but you can see it's kind of weird that it's concentrating on the skin in these glandular areas uh, and that the, the researchers don't have a clear explanation for that. But anyway, I, you know, it just doesn't take too much uh, drawing of analogies to figure out that, you know, there are unintended consequences when you take a synthetic molecule and apply it to an ecosystem. We took DDT and we applied it to an ecosystem because the mosquitoes were an issue. Uh, and then it took us some time to figure out that while wow, that had some unintended consequences and perhaps we weren't going to be very happy with it. Um, and I think the same is going to happen in skin. I think we've used some ingredients and I think perhaps over time we'll be reconsidering. I have a dream. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. So are there any questions? Brilliant, it's better to pick it Any questions? Yeah.